Hey, STAT students, how you doing? Today we're going to be talking about probability models, and in particular we're going to be talking about three probability models, the binomial and geometric, which you've never heard of before, and the normal random variable, which you have heard of before in the context of data. Now we're going to look at it in the context of being a random variable. Uh, first off, let's look at the binomial and geometric. And the way to look at binomial and geometric is to look at the building block that makes up the, bi the binomial and geometric models, and that is the Bernoulli random variable. This is named after uh, one of the Bernoulli brothers, I think it was uh, Jacob Bernoulli, uh, a very famous Swiss mathematician, but uh, and his whole family was made up of, uh, of really uh, impressive mathematicians. But anyway, it's a really simple random variable. That is, two options, success, failure. Okay? Probability of success, we call it P. Probability of failure is 1 minus P, or Q. Okay? It's like flipping a coin, one flip. Or throwing a dart, one throw. Okay? Success, failure. All right? uh, there's our probability model right there. You can either get zero successes or one success. Uh, the probability of zero successes is Q. probability of one success is P. Now, this is a very simple random variable, but it's going to be worth our while to go ahead and uh, uh, look at the probability model and actually calculate the expected value and the uh, standard deviation because we're going to use that later on. So let's do that now. Uh, to find the expected value, we would do x times p of x, and so 0 times q is 0, 1 times p is p, add those two things up, and I get p. So my expected value is p, my mean is p. So now, x minus the mean. Well, 0 minus p is negative p, 1 minus p is, as we saw, it's q, so we got q there. Uh, next column, if you remember, to find the variance, we're going to square this. So negative p squared is p squared, q squared is q squared. And now our next column, we're going to multiply this times, by the way, if this is looking foreign to you, you need to go back and look at the last, uh, the last video, because this is how we calculate the variance. Uh, so we're going to take this and multiply it times the probability, so now we get p squared times q and q squared times p, and so those are our it's the, the, the distance from each possible value to, me, to the mean times the probability, sorry, squared, times the probability of that value occurring. And so when I add these up, I get my variance, which is p squared q plus q squared p, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, and you know something? We can factor out a p times q from this. And so I get pq times p plus q. But what is P plus Q? It's the probability of success plus the probability of failure. That's just 1. So this is PQ times 1, which is just PQ. Okay. So what have I found out? I found out that the mean of my Bernoulli random variable is P, and the variance is PQ. You don't really care about this in the context of a Bernoulli random variable, but later on when we're looking at lots of Bernoulli random variables, this is going to be very, very handy. Okay? So, Bernoulli trials, speaking of lots and lots of Bernoulli random variables, it's a sequence of Bernoulli random variables. Okay? So this time, I'm flipping a coin, and then flipping a coin, and then flipping a coin, and then flipping a coin. Each flip needs to be independent of all the others. Okay? Uh, there's always just two possible outcomes, success or failure. Uh, the probability of success has to be constant. And since the probability of success is always constant, that would lead you to believe that these trials are going to be independent, and yes, they are. And, uh, and as we just saw a second ago, for each trial, the expected uh, value of x is p, and the variance of x is p times q. Okay? So that's our Bernoulli random variable. Now let's look at the geometric model. The geometric model is a sequence of Bernoulli random variables, and what it is, is we're going to count the number of trials that it takes to get our first success. That's what a geometric model is. Okay? So, uh, um, x is going to be the number of trials until the first success occurs, including that first success. Okay? Uh, P is still the probability of success, and Q is the probability of failure. And uh, just to, to give this some context, uh, it's like flipping a coin and saying, how many flips will it take until I get my first head, okay? Or uh, let me roll a die and count the number of rolls that it takes to get my first six, okay? 
or the number of cards that I draw, replacing the card each time to keep my probability constant, uh, until I get an ace. Uh, in this case, uh, P would be one half, because you've got a 50 50 chance of getting ahead. In this case, P would be one sixth, because there's a one sixth probability of rolling six. And in this case, P would be one thirteenth, uh, uh, because there's four aces out of 52 cards, and four out of 52 is one out of 13. Okay? The way we write this, the way we write uh, that this is a geometric random variable, is right up there. We say x and a little tilde geometric with, with our, our, our uh, parameter p. Okay? Not everybody writes it that way, but I write it that way. Okay? Uh, so, this is what our probability tree looks like. So, you start here and you have your first trial. Okay? You either get success, in which case you stop, or failure, in which case you go on. And then you do it again. Success or failure, in which case you go on. Success or failure, in which case you go on, etc., etc., etc. Kind of forever. So it's a weird looking tree. It's a tree that never stops and it's really bottom heavy. Okay? Uh, now, you're thinking to yourself, well, it can't go on forever because at some point you're going to have success. You're right. At some point you will have a success, but theoretically, this this model does really go on forever and ever, okay? So, what's the probability that x would be 1? Well, that's just one trial, right? So that's getting a success the first time. That's going to be p. The probability that x is 2, that would be a failure, then a success. That would be q times p. The probability that x is 3 would be failure, failure, success. So q times q times p, so there we go, q squared times p. Probably that x is 4, you see this pattern now, failure, 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 success. So that would be q to the third times p. So as you see, the probability that x is any little x is going to be q to the x minus 1 times p. Okay? Alright. So that gives us, oh, well first of all, here's the histogram that you would get if you were to do these trials over and over and over. There's the probability of success the first time, there's the probability of success the second time, and on and on and on. Now, your, your histogram is going to look different depending on what P is, but it's always going to have this general shape. The mode is always going to be 1. Always. Just think about it. Q is a number less than 1, so P has got to be bigger than Q times P, which it has to be bigger than Q squared times P, etc., etc. So your mode is always 1. Uh, what's your mean? Hmm. Well, to find that out, we've got to do a little more, uh, uh, a little, little more work here. Here's our probability model, okay? Probability that x is 1 is p, probability that x is 2 is q times p, we just went through this, probability that x is 3 is q squared times p, etc., etc. So uh, then to calculate the mean, we would say, okay, 1 times p is p, 2 times qp is 2qp, 3 times q squared p is 3q squared p, etc., etc., etc. And, uh, whoo, baby, this, uh, this is going to be hard to calculate, or at least it appears first, that this is going to be hard to calculate. My first question is, all of my probabilities have to add up to 1, right? Do these add up to 1? Huh. I don't know. If I were to add up all these probabilities, I would get P plus Q P plus Q squared P plus Q cubed P, etc. I could factor out a P from that and get P times 1 plus Q plus Q squared plus Q cubed, etc., 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 but does that equal 1? Hmm. We'll have to find that out. My other question is, what is this? Uh, that's my expected value. Again, I can factor out a p, but I get this 1 plus 2 cubed plus 3 q squared plus 4 q cubed. Uh, that does not just you know, pop into my brain as far as what that sum is going to be. And it's an infinite sum. It's a sum of infinite terms. Uh, can I even add that up? Well, the answer is, yeah. Matter of fact, I can. Okay? Let's look at the first one. Okay? Let's look at this p times 1 plus q plus q squared plus q cubed. And in particular, I want to look at this sum right here. Okay? Now, I don't know what this is, so I'm going to call it x. Alright? And now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to multiply this times q. So on the right, I get q times x. On the left, I get 1 times q is q, q times q is q squared, q squared times q is q cubed. And you can see that I shifted it over like that, and the reason I shifted it over is that now 
I'm going to subtract this minus this. And as you can see, 1 goes down here and all the other terms just cancel out. And then I get x minus qx over here, and I can factor out an x there and get 1 minus q times x. And that means that x equals 1 over 1 minus q. I just divide both sides by 1 minus q. And 1 minus q, that's p. So that means this equals 1 over p. Well, that means that the, prob that the sum of all my probabilities equals p times 1 over p, and that's just 1, which is exactly what it should be. So that works out, and I'm happy. Okay? Now let's, uh, let's stay in a real mathy mode for a second, and let's, uh, let's look at this other infinite sum that we have here. Uh, this one here, 1 plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed squared plus 4 cubed cubed, etc., etc. And again, I don't know what that is, so until I know what it is, I'm just going to call it x. And again, I'm going to multiply uh, this, <coughs> both sides of this equation by q. On my right, I get qx, and on my left, 1 times q is q, 2 times q, 2 q, uh, sorry, q times 2 q is 2 q squared, 3 q squared times q is 3 q cubed, etc., etc. And again, I subtract this line minus this line, but this time, these don't cancel out. This time, instead, what I get is 1 plus q plus q squared plus q cubed plus q to the fourth equals, again, 1 minus q times x. And, use your memory a little bit, we know what this is. We just calculated it a second ago. It's 1 over p. And so dividing both sides by 1 minus q, I get x equals 1 over p divided by 1 minus q. And this, again, this is just p. So it's 1 divided by p divided by p again, which is just 1 over p squared. That means my expected value of x is p times 1 over p squared, which is 1 over p. Got it. Got my expected value. You can continue using this type of uh, uh, this type of procedure and figure out what the variance is, uh, what I think is probably the case is that you've had enough. Okay, so we won't worry about the variance right now. Really, all you need to know about with the geometric model is that it's the number of Bernoulli trials that it takes to get a success, that the probability of any particular value is going to be P, probability of success, times the probability of failure, Q, to the, that value minus 1. Okay? and that the expected value of that, uh, of that number is 1 over p. And let's just stop for a second and think about what this means. Let's say you go to a large university, and let's say that one, uh, one fifth of everybody there is a psychology major. Okay, lots of psychology majors. 20% of the place is psychology majors. Okay, so you're going to walk around and you're just going to randomly choose people. Terrible way to gather your data, but let's just say it works. Uh, you're just going to randomly choose people and ask what their major is until you find a psych major, okay? One-fifth of the people are psych majors. How many people will it take you to get your first psych major? Well, a lot of y'all are going to think, well, if one-fifth of the people are psych majors, then that means one out of every five will be a psychology major. That means, I don't know, five people. You're right. It is five people. It's exactly five people. It's one over one-fifth, the reciprocal of one-fifth. 5. So it's actually, this is intuitively correct, okay? This is all you need to know about geometric random variables, okay? They're fairly easy. Now let's look at the binomial random variable. When I said they're fairly, they're fairly easy, I don't mean the math that we used to derive that was easy, I just mean that the result is fairly easy, okay? Now, this is way more important. The binomial model, this time we're not counting trials to get a success. This time, our number of trials is fixed, okay? We write it this way, x, little tilde, binomial with our uh, uh, parameters n and p. n is the number of trials that we're, that we're performing, okay? n is fixed, it doesn't change, okay? p is, again, it's the, uh, the probability of success. And so this time what we're going to be calculating is the number of successes. We're not stopping after a success this time. We're keeping going until we get to n trials, and then we're just going to count the number of successes. And still, P is our probability of success, Q is our probability of failure. And so, this would be like, uh, if I'm flipping a coin, I flip the coin 10 times, and then I count the number of heads that I got, okay? Could be 10, could be zero, probably isn't either of those, it's probably more like four, five, or six. Uh, but that would be a binomial random variable, 
where n is 10 and p is 1 half. Uh, or the number of sixes I get when I roll a die 15 times. I'm going to roll it 15 times. It doesn't matter how many successes or failures I get. I roll it 15 times, and then I count the number of successes. So that's a random variable where n is 15. It's a binomial random variable where n is 15 and p is 1 sixth. Or, again, uh, the number of aces when I draw a card, and then replace it each time, from a deck 20 times. So I draw a card, I look at it, I put it back, I shuffle it, I draw a card, I look at it, I put it back, I shuffle it, I draw a card, I look at it. I do that 20 times, and then I say, how many aces did I get from that procedure? That, that number, that number of successes, would be a binomial random variable where n is 20 and p is 1 13th, because there's four aces out of 52 cards. Okay? That's my binomial random variable. So here's what the tree looks like with the binomial random variable. This is what the tree looks like when n is just 2. Okay? Uh, now, like I said, there's two trials. So either success or failure. And then the second trial, either success or failure. As you can see, these are independent trials. So therefore, this looks just like this. Then uh, your uh, uh, probability of success or failure never changes. And uh, so the probability of two successes would just be p times p. So there we go, probability of two successes is p squared. The probability of zero successes is q times q, q squared, that uh, goes with that. And the probability of one success, well, there's two different ways we can get there. You can either go success-failure or failure-success. Either way, the probability is going to be p times q, but there's two different ways of doing it, so therefore the probability of getting one success is actually two times p times q. Okay? Uh, so, here's what it looks like if there are three trials, okay? And again, the probability of three successes is going to be p to the third. The probability of three failures, so zero successes, is going to be q to the third. The probability of one success is, and if you think about it, this part is kind of easy to get. The probability of one success means you succeeded once, you failed twice, so there's going to be a p to the 1 and q squared, but how many branches like that do we have? Uh, let's see, there's one here, and then one here, and then one here. So predicting this number is a little more difficult. And as we see now, uh, here's where n equals 4. <laughs> it just, ah! It's starting to get, uh, it's starting to get really messy here. So, um, uh, how in the world are we going to figure out? Like I said, the exponents are easy. You know, if I, if I say the probability of one success, well, that means it's just going to be p to the 1 times q to the 3 because I had three failures. But how do I get this number, or this number, or this number? How do I get those coefficients? That's the question. Well, the key is in the name. It's the binomial model. What does binomial mean? It's a polynomial with two terms. Huh. A polynomial with two terms. Well, if I take the polynomial p plus q, that's a polynomial with two terms, so it's a binomial. If I square that, what do I get? I get p squared plus 2pq plus q squared. Hey, look. Hey, how about that? If I take that same binomial p plus q and I cube it, I get p cubed plus 3p squared q plus 3pq squared plus q cubed. Hey. Hmm. If I take it to the fourth power, what do you know? Interesting. So that means I can use, I've seen this before, I've expanded these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, powers of binomials before, and so I've seen these coefficients before, they're called binomial coefficients, and uh, this is what they are. P plus Q to the n power, this is straight out of Algebra 2 or Precalculus, P plus Q to the n power is the sum of, hey, what is that? That's, uh, that's my binomial coefficient, times P to the K, times Q to the n minus K. K is our number of successes. Uh, there's two ways of writing this binomial coefficient. You can either write it that way or this way. The way you say it is n choose K. Okay? There's a reason we're using the word choose. This is equivalent to the number of ways that you can choose k objects out of a total of n objects. 
And to tell you the truth, this is a type of math called combinatorics. We could spend the rest of the semester talking about nothing but combinatorics. It's actually a really, really interesting uh, uh, branch of mathematics. We're not going there, though. We just don't have time. Our focus lies elsewhere. So we're just going to have to stop right now and say, hey, you know where you can find this? A calculator. That's where you can find it. Okay? Now, what if you're saying, yeah, but I don't have a calculator at home. Well, there actually is one other way of doing it using Pascal's triangle. This is actually really cool. Check this out. Okay. Write a one. Now write two more ones. Okay? Now, put ones on the end, and as far as the middle, you go one plus one is two. One's on the end. One plus two is three. Two plus one is three. Put ones on the end. One plus three is four. Three plus three is six. Three plus one is four. Do it again. One, one's on the end. One plus four is five. Four plus six is ten. Six plus four is ten. Four plus one is five. And, uh, and so if I have, if I have a, a, a binomial random variable where n is five, I can use this line right here to get my coefficients. And then all the rest of them, you know, just uh, uh, keep on with that process. And if you have a binomial random variable where n is 14, well, you get to use all of these coefficients to figure out what your, uh, uh, what your probabilities are. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's, uh, it's what you can do in case you don't happen to have a calculator with you. Otherwise, I would definitely just use a calculator to get those, uh, uh, those binomial coefficients. Uh, so, what do we need to know about the binomial model? Well, we need to know that x is the number of successes in n Bernoulli trials, if x is a binomial random variable, uh, where p is the probability of success, q is the probability of failure, and that the probability of getting x successes is this n choose x, which we can either write like this or like this, times p to the x times q to the n minus x. p to the number of successes times q to the number of failures. All right? Uh, now, your next obvious question is, yeah, but what's the mean? Thank you for asking. Okay? What is the mean of a binomial random variable, and what's the variance of that binomial random variable? Well, let's make a probability model and do all of our... No, let's not. Let, no, let's not do that. Okay? Instead, let's think about what this is. This binomial random variable is the sum of a bunch of Bernoulli random variables. Okay? Think about it. We're, we're taking the number of successes. Each Bernoulli random variable is 1 if it's a success and 0 if it's a failure. So if I'm counting up the number of successes, that means I'm just summing up all these Bernoulli random variables. I'm summing up n Bernoulli random variables. Well, what's the expected value of the sum of a bunch of random variables? It's the sum of the expected value. Okay? So we just add up all these expected values, and what we get is n times the expected value of that Bernoulli random variable, which, if you remember, was p. So that means the, the, uh, the expected value of my binomial random variable is just n times p. What was the variance of that Bernoulli random variable? It was p times q. So that means the variance of my binomial random variable is going to be variance of the first Bernoulli random variable plus variance of the second plus and on and on and on, which is just going to be n times p times q. Okay? So here's my mean n times p and here's my variance n times p times q. Please know that. It's going to be very, very important as we go along. Okay? So that was the geometric and the binomial random variables. Oh, got to talk about the 10% condition. Okay, remember I was talking about when I draw a card, uh, I have to make sure that I put it back, because if I kept it out, then I would not, I'd be changing the, uh, the, the probabilities. And so if I, if I choose without replacement, then I no longer have independent trials. Well, go back to the example where I was going around asking people what their major was. Did I ever ask somebody twice? I probably didn't, okay? Once I asked somebody, I wouldn't go back to that person because it's annoying. They already asked me, they already answered me once. I'm not gonna go back and ask again. Well, what that means is I'm sampling without replacement. I'm not sampling with replacement. Uh, if I'm assuming independence, I have to sample with replacement because sampling without replacement means it's not gonna be independent. However, if my population is really big, Taking out one person really doesn't make that much of a difference at all. 
the difference is negligible. And so what I have to say is, well, how big does my population have to be? And the answer is, if the sample size is less than 10% of the population, then the difference between uh, sampling with replacement and sampling without replacement is so small that you don't have to worry about it. Okay? And since both geometric and bin binomial random variables use uh, the Bernoulli trials, in order, to use, a, in order to, to use the geometric model or the binomial model, you got to check out this 10% condition. You've got to make sure that your sample size is smaller than 10% of your population. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, you've lost independence. Okay? Okay, so now let's talk about our old buddy, the normal model, the bell curve. Okay? We talked about the normal model in the context of data being normally distributed. Now we're going to talk about a random variable being normally distributed. And it's really pretty much the same thing, okay? Uh, it's a continuous rather than discrete uh, model. Now what this means is, with the binomial and geometric random variables, uh, I, I knew that x could be 1, or 2, or 3, or 4. x couldn't be 1.5. x couldn't be 1.75, okay? With the normal model, x can be anything. It can be pi. It can be the square root of 11. It can be any number at all. Now, think about it for a second. Uh, if I say, pick a number between 1 and 10, and I mean integer, then you'd say, oh, well, there's a 1 out of 10 chance that I'll be right, okay? But what if I say, pick a number between 1 and 10, oh, and round it to the closest tenth? Well, oh, now there's a whole lot more numbers. Okay, so now my probability of being right it's gone way, way down. But what if I say pick a number between 1 and 10 and it can be any real number at all? Like pi, or like the square root of 37, or the cube root of 512, or, oh man, you, uh, okay, yes, the cube root of 512 is between 1 and 10. Uh, but uh, now, really, there's, there's an infinite number of numbers that I could choose from and so now the probability of being right is basically one out of infinity, which is zero. I'm not going to be right. So the normal model is a continuous random variable, just like that random variable that I was just talking about. The random variable I was just referring to is known as a uniform random variable, a continuous uniform random variable. Okay? So you don't say, what's the probability that x equals something? Because that's just going to be zero. Okay? What you say is, what's the probability that x is between two numbers, or less than something, or greater than something, okay? And you saw that we did that earlier when we were looking at the, the data. So, if you remember, how did we do it? We found z-scores, you take your values, you subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and then you use either a table or a calculator to find the probabilities from the z-scores, okay? One thing to keep in mind is that if x and y are normally distributed random variables, then the sum of x and y and the difference of x and y are also normally distributed. That's going to be an important fact. Uh, here's our normal curve, and if you remember the imperial rule, the, sorry, the empirical rule, uh, it also works with random variables, and what that means is the probability that x is between uh, uh, mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma, that is, within one sigma of your mean, the probability that x is there is going to be about 68%, the probability that x is within two standard deviations of your mean is 95%, and the probability that x is within three standard deviations of the mean is 99.7%. Uh, it's the exact same rule as we had before. The only thing that's different is our language is slightly different. We're not saying 95% uh, of the data fall within this. We're saying the probability of my random variable being there is 95%. Okay? Uh, now, here's something interesting. What's interesting is the binomial random variable, the binomial distribution, starts looking a lot like the normal distribution when n gets big. And let me show you what I mean. Okay? Here is a histogram from two flips of a coin. Okay? My, my probability is uh, one-fifth. That's the, the p is one-fifth. That's the probability of success. And I flipped my coin twice. There's a 25% chance of no heads. There's a 50% uh, chance of getting one head. And there's a a uh, 25% chance of getting two heads. Okay? Very simple looking histogram. Uh, here's the histogram with three flips. Uh, here's the histogram with four flips. Now my probability of getting zero 
uh, heads has gone down to less than, I think it's about 6% there it looks like. Uh, here's the histogram with 5, here's the histogram with 10, and I don't know if you can see this, but it's starting to have this little bit of a bell shape there. Uh, here we are with 20, here we are with 40, and now I'm very bell shaped. Here we are with 60, with 100, and with 500, and you should be noticing two things. One thing you should be noticing is it gets more and more bell shaped the more n goes up, and it also gets skinnier with respect to the entire range. Okay? As a matter of fact, this is pretty much zero, or just really, really close to zero until you get to about 200. And then after 300, it's really, really close to zero again. In fact, let's, let's pull this out a little bit. And uh, there's our curve. And now you can see it is extremely bell-shaped. As a matter of fact, if I were to take a normal curve and just lay it over this, it would look like that. So what does this mean? What this means is the normal curve is a very, very good estimator of the binomial model uh, when n is big. You might be saying, what, what does big mean? We'll get to that in a second, okay? So that's what it looks like when you overlay it over 500. This is what it looks like when you put the normal model over 100 uh, uh, trials. This is what it looks like when you put it over 60 trials. It's not quite as good an estimator as it was before, but still eh, pretty darn good. Uh, here's 40. Uh, uh, you can see it's getting a little, little more off there. Uh, now... Now the question is, we've been doing this just when p equals 0.5, when it's nice and symmetric. What about when p is 0.7, which means q would be 0.3? Well, let's do it again. Here's one flip. 70% chance of success, 30% chance of failure. Two flips. 49% chance of uh, two successes, 51% chance of something else. Three flips. Four flips. This, I say flip because I'm imagining I'm flipping a, a very unfair coin. Uh, five, I'll call it trials instead of flips. Here's ten, and now you can see that even though it's skewed over here, even though it's skewed to the left, it's starting to become much more bell-shaped. And now at twenty, you can see where the normal model uh, starts to be a somewhat good uh, predictor. Here we are at forty, and now the normal model is actually, it's really not bad at all. Okay? So, when n is big, the, the, the histogram that you get from a binomial model and the normal curve are pretty much the exact same curve, the difference being that this is a discrete random variable and this is continuous. Uh, what does big mean? Okay? n is big enough. Okay? Well, uh, statisticians generally agree that when both n times p and n times 1 minus p, or n times q, are greater than 10, the normal distribution is a good enough uh, uh, estimator of the binomial distribution, okay? And by good enough, it just means that uh, the difference between uh, the probabilities that you'll get from calculating a normal uh, uh, model and the, calculators, the probabilities that you get from calculating a uh, binomial model, the differences are negligible, okay? Uh, now, please notice, instead of memorizing n times p and n times 1 minus p, just remember, n times p, that's the expected number of successes. n times 1 minus p or n times q, that's the expected number of failures. So as long as you're expecting to get at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures, you can use the normal model as a uh, replacement for the binomial model. And you might be saying, why would I ever do that? Remember how hard it was to come up with those binomial coefficients? It's a lot easier just to carry a little table of, uh, of z-scores around with you than it is to uh, calculate those binomial coefficients, okay? Now, uh, here we have a, uh, a sort of a summary of what we've seen about our probability models. Uh, the geometric and binomial uh, prob probability models, those are both discrete random variables. They're both uh, um, independent Bernoulli trials where p is constant. The difference is that the geometric model is uh, your random variable is the number of trials it takes to get a success, whereas with the binomial model, uh, your random variable is, uh, uh, is the number of successes we get out of n trials. Uh, 
Um, we talked about what the, uh, the uh, formulas are to, uh, to get your probabilities and also the expected value of the geometric random variable. With the binomial, we talked about the, formal, the, the, the uh, formula used to get the probabilities as well as both the expected value and the variance of the random variable. There should be a variance of x in there. That's a typo. Sorry about that. Uh, and then with our normal random variable, remember it's a continuous random variable. It's a very good estimator of the binomial model when n is big enough. Remember when you have a, a, at least 10 expected success, successes and at least 10 expected failures. And, uh, uh, and, and there you go. n is big enough when you have that uh, condition. Okay? Uh, so that's it about those three models. Our next video is going to be about sampling distributions and the central limit theorem, the big theorem about statistics. See you then.